hi hi and welcome to my stream and scream <clears throat> there would be so much to breathe that her phone would be destroyed before you could hear her get sucked into the tornado also you have to put two dollars in the jar she could be in a wreck I can't hit it anymore <coughs> especially with this wind You'd probably be able to hear her get in the wreck. Unless the phone got thrown out of the car. Or or if it was crushed. Alright, bud. Enough of that. You're gonna give your mother a heart attack. Ask her if she can see anything! <laughs> Christ, Laura. Yeah, you ask her. Talk to your mother, Kelly. Okay. Who for crying in the more Kelly, can you see anything out there? Uh, you mean like a tornado? No, Kelly, I'm wondering if you see any corn. Uh, plenty of corn. Now's not the time, Kelly. Sorry. Tornado was eased of here. Kelly went to Grandpa's house in northwest of here. She wouldn't see a tornado unless there was another one. I mean, which is very possible. I just wanted to make sure, Ben. If Kelly gets sucked in a tornado or gets in a car wreck, could I have her computer? Benjamin! What? She won't need it. If she's not using it, no one will be. It wouldn't be fair if I couldn't have it. Okay, but I think that's fair. If Kelly gets sucked into a tornado, I'm sure she'd be okay with letting you have her computer. What about her room? Please, Ben. That's enough. <laughs> Tell you what. I'll leave her room on the table. You never know. We could get some damage here and her room might be a giant hole in the city. If I were you, I'd wait and see on that investment. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Your brother sometimes. God bless him. Let me talk to him. Cool. Are you, you sure about that? Yeah. Okay. You asked for it. Then here. Talk to your sister. I don't wanna. You can ask her about the computer. Oh wait, no. That was the, that was the dad. Sorry. <laughs> he was mimicking the mom. He was mocking her. You know. Let me have the phone. <laughs> Dad says I can have your computer if you crash or get sucked into a tornado. Hey, Benji. Don't call me that. You know I hate it when you call me that. My name isn't Benji, it's Ben. Sorry, I forgot. No. Do it again. I don't want to promise. I said that last time. It won't happen again. Check out some. Mom and Dad are arguing in the corner. I don't think I can hear them. What are they arguing about? Mom thinks we should be in the storage room on the east side of the house because she says it's further underground. Is it? No. One of the walls is only halfway covered. She's also afraid the water heater in here could explode. If that happens, we'd be killed even if we're in the other room. We'd burn to death. So, you guys in the safest room? Eh. We're least likely to be killed by a tornado if we're in this room. No guarantee in either room. Tornado and debris are unpredictable. Sounds like you've kind of thought this out. It's just common sense. Are you scared? Yeah. Uh, it'll be okay, or I don't know. Hal, you're not even here. You're talking really fast. Oh, I really don't feel right. Anything I can do to help? How? We can just, you know, talk. What about? How you doing? Really? <laughs> Fine. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Why would you think I'm lying? That is not what I meant. What did you mean? With everything that's happened, I'm worried is all. Everything? What is everything? Uh, stuff with Dad. I don't want to talk about that. I won't tell Dad what you said. I said I don't want to talk about it. Sorry, damn. 
Ben, let me have that phone, huh? I don't want to talk about Dad, and Kelly won't stop asking me about him. I'm not talking about her when Dad always gets drunk when he knows that I don't like it. Okay, we opened up a fucking can of worms. If you could just calm your shit down. <laughs> this is why you need a doctor there, Ben. Stop telling me what to do! God! <laughs> it sounds like Napoleon died of what I just realized. I'm not trying to. But, but look at me. Let go of me! I smell like alcohol! I know, I know. Look at me, Ben. Stop. Look at me there. Now. Remember how we count. I said, let go of me! Come on, I'll count. I'll add a dollar for each time. One. Two. That's it. Keep going. Three. Four. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There, now tell me. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. You have to put ten more dollars in the jar. Dude, as soon as the tornado warning is over, you apologize to your sister now. Dad wants me to apologize to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for pressing you. Don't do it again. Won't. I don't like the sirens. Yeah, me neither. The summer hurts. I have an idea. What? What is it? You wanna do a story like we used to? I already wrote one to do. Yes. Dad is Batman. He's he's um not the dad. We deserve, but he's the dad that we need. <laughs> oh, do you want to read it to me? I left it in my room. I would get it, but mom and dad would yell at me because it's dangerous to go upstairs or a tornado. Oh, well, that's too bad. I remember it. I, I could tell you. Alright. Ready? Wait, what's it called? Untitled. Oh, well, okay then. <laughs> you ready now? Yeah. The village sat in a wide valley cut high in the mountains. It was a place of plenty. A gash of green and otherwise cold slate rising above on all sides. Those living in the village called the place View. But those who lived higher in the mountains, burly miners digging for precious glints of yellow, and blue called it the trough. Those in the valley resented the use of his name, but meekly allowed its use by the hardly mount by the hardy mountain folk. The people of view or the trough had lived there for centuries. They were mostly farmers, though a fair number of merchants made a home in the valley for most of the year save for the month when they would venture upwards in the mining towns to sell the harvest bounty at a premium. They would return home with bags filled with chips of yellow and blue tied to fine leather belts clinking brightly with wealth. The next year they betrayed half of their shining flints to the farmers for a share of the harvest they would in turn cart up to the mining villages yet again. Who flowed out and outwards from the valley, and the yellow and blue would trickle down, gathered in the valley like a collection basis. This continued for hundreds, on the perhaps thousands of years. Dozens of generations of farmers' fathers, merchants' sons, were born, grew wealthier with the mountain's precious stones, and were buried beneath the plush pasture. The valley until the beast descended. Mining folk in the higher reaches of the mountains had passed tales of the beasts around for as long as their history stretched. As the highest peak of the northernmost mountain, they said, lived the beast. It watched in all directions through slit eyes, biding its time 
until it would enact a calamity. It was a na nightmare of immense and terrible power. The miners would whisper a thing of abject cruelty. Man, the diction in this kid. <laughs> but it was also a patient creature. It waited until it felt ready to unleash such cruelty and malice that its ravenous hunger for chaos would be sated. Some believed it waited until enough infants cried out with the newborn whales to descend from its perch and devour each and every last babe. Others believed it was simply waiting until age of plenty before cascading down an era of sickness and madness, fire and char and blood, when all those peered upon from the mountaintop. One day, after hundreds of generations of farmers and traders had lived and died in the valley, it appeared in view. The beast had risen in the trough. It appeared without warning, neither sound nor fury, but simply there, curled atop four legs, steaming breath rising from a black maw, leathery wings folded on its hulking shape, it towered over the center of the village, ominously silent. It did not move, did not even seem to be living, save for the sleeping steam billowing from its slime slicked snout. Good alliteration there. Slime slicked snout. Slime slicked snout. Slime slicked snout. Slime slicked snout. Say that five times fast. Huh? <laughs> The village's warriors were called to arms, and the ceremonial horn echoing off the walls, also known as a tornado siren, of the valley, aching towards a pregnant silence. After a moment stretched thin, they rushed towards the beast, their spears angled at its massive form. The rest of the village watched from the safety of embroidered drapery as the spear splintered against the beast's hide. The honed blades shattered like glass. I'm gonna get hit by a tornado in the time it takes for my brother to finish the story. <laughs> the warriors fell to the earth, crying out as their arms, as splintered as their spears, hung lifeless by their sides. The beast did not stir. The village's warriors were buried the next morning have been perished during the night. Those who tend to their wounds would later claim their eyes turned black as if their light was leached from within. The people of view with the trough gathered to discuss what was to be done. The beast slumbered, but for how long and why did it sleep? And perhaps, most worryingly of all, how had it arrived in the valley? Not a soul had seen its arrival. It was almost as if the thing had simply materialized in the center of the village. Some proposed it had emerged from the earth itself. I had no idea the story was going to have been so long or I would have been more of a dick to my brother. <laughs> but if that were the case, how had the soil, the valuable rich rare earth, source of their plenty and their affluence birthed such a terrible creature. Some were quick to suggest leaving the valley. We could send into the alcoves of the mountains, said the merchants. With no one to tend to the fields, how would we eat, the farmers countered. They debated for a long time what they should do. As the week passed, they forget, began to forget that they had a choice. Trapped by the gravity their indecision. They remained in the valley. The creature slept, and the creature breathed. Each breath, its skin rolled, animating the thorny black scales of the rolling obsidian briar. But it did not rouse, it did not move, it did not rain terror from the skies, 
nor did it consume children by the score it slept. The people of Vue considered sending an envoy to appeal to the miners of the mound for help, but they knew they would receive none. So the farmers continued to tend to their land. The merchants made their yearly trek to the treacherous trails to collect what little chips of wealth the miners had collected in exchange for the farmers' yield. Year to year, however, there seemed to be a little less. A little less harvest, a little less yellow and blue passed around the snowy alcoves hard from unforgiving rock, a little less green in the valley, a little less light. This continued for twenty years, until the day it began to rain. In order for brevity, I'm dropping the accent, I want to get to this story. I can read this a lot better if I don't sound like Napoleon Dynamite. The people of you or the trough watch the clouds roll in from the south, whence the clouds usually arrived laden with water from a faraway sea, but from the north, where there was but ice and stone and mountain. The rain draped the valley in a dampness that did not relent, but instead crept into every corner. The mountains themselves seemed to sweat and pour into the valley. The water carried with it a quiet rot. The first harvest after the rain produced a meager crop, and what little could be gathered was black with mold before the merchants had a chance to train it for the yellow and blue. Their livestock fared no better. The animals began developing weeping sores that became infected and killed with a quick fever. That winter, the people of Trough or View watched one another waste away as they began to starve. The people of View could delay asking for help no longer, sending an envoy into the, muscle, the mu mountains to appeal for assistance. They found the mines deserted. The people of View were truly on their own. The next harvest was worse. Every last crop had turned mealy and infested before midsummer. By the end of the season, the last of their livestock was dead. The people of the trough watched one another, descending into a state of hungry madness, devouring the rotting wood sloughing from their homes in slimy heaps, and their fine leather belts that had once held yellow and blue, now sprouting spores of black mold. The village and its residents were rotting away. A group of villagers approached the beast after the last of their livelihood had perished, sloughing through the swamp of oh, slogging, sorry, slogging through the swamp of waist-high mud to make a plea to the beast. We're sorry if we've offended you, mighty creature. We offer ourselves to you in hopes that our sacrifice will satisfy your hunger. In unison, the villagers submerged into the tarry mud, suff suffocating in the muck. The beast slept. As the rains from the north continued on their third year, the few remaining people in Trough began to prophesy about the beast. It had come and brought with it great devastation, they could agree. It had brought the rains from the month from the north, and it had brought a rot to the village that would not relent. Squatting what little remained of their crumbled homes, they dreamt of the day that the beast would be satisfied, when it would wake and leave their valley and allow them to farm the land. They dreamt of the day that the miners would return, bringing with them their precious bits of wealth. The time will come, they said, when the beast will wake from its slumber and spread its wings. Reach, uh, I just looked up and saw that giant fucking dragon flash across the lightning. I don't know if you guys saw that or not, but... The time will come, they said, when the beast will wake from its slumber and spread its wings. I thought maybe it was a tornado for a second. <laughs> Reaching from one end of the valley to the other, with the beat of those mighty wings, it will ascend aloft a squall, and the wind will lift away our rot. The villagers waited for this day to come. A generation came and went, born into the rain and long rotten in the moldy dirt. The few survivors had long abandoned hope that the beast would return to its mountain perch. It was perpetual, manifestation of their loss. The beast slept. Until it did not. The day the beast awoke, the villagers celebrated. They watched it stretch its long, horrible form into shape. I'd shuddering it shook the decades of rain from its thorny scales. They sang to the beast as it stood uncertainly and reared on its haunches, unfolding the scarred leather wings from one end of the valley to the other. The time of the beast's departure had finally arrived. The time had come for the cleansing wind. 
The beast beat its wings, emitting a tired and ugly groan as it lifted from the sodden earth. With a final sigh, it shot high into the air, sending a great gust of wind through the valley that toppled what dismal dwellings remain haphazardly standing. The valley was wiped clean. The villagers were knocked from their feet from the rush of wind. As they struggled upright, they felt the sun on their skin for the first time. They rejoiced. Their pale forms dancing in a pitiful display of frailty. God damn! This kid has a memory! Seriously! Like, this kid needs to go on Jeopardy! Or he could be earning this family some money and sister no longer has to work. He's got a talent. And if you're good at something, you should never do it for free, they say. <laughs> they could return to their way of their ancestors. They would know plenty. They, pr they planted their first crop before the grass had even green, with a newfound acuity for the hunger pains that plagued them constantly. But the grass did not wax green, and the crops did not grow. The decades of rains from the north had left the earth poisoned. There was no going back. They would not know plenty, nor would they silent the constant muttering of their stomach. Their rot had been lifted, and in its place, sterility. The sun shone, but it was upon a new land. A land turned to jagged, unforgiving slate, where perhaps bits of yellow and blue could be scavenged if one dug deeply enough to find a petrified leather belt. That's the end. You remembered all of that? I don't have it with me to read. I obviously remembered it. Did you like it? Yeah, sure, why not? I'll print you a copy. What were you doing at Grandpa's house? Uh, just visiting. Well, there's no one there to visit. I can't see Jack and shit. I just wanted to see it. Oh. Why didn't you ask if I wanted to go? We're still asleep. You could have woken me up. Did you want to go? Not really. Did you find anything here? Something for you, actually. What is it? A guitar pick. A guitar pick, sorry. Why would I want a guitar pick? It's really old. Lots of things are old. I don't really care. Yes, we can still see the corn. The corn's the most important part. We can play together. I don't want to. Okay. You can keep the guitar pick. I don't want it. I oh, well. Are you crying? No, I'm not crying. Just because that Jesse person kicked you out of your house? Then I don't. Or is it because you had to move back home so you couldn't find a job? Mom and Dad are worried about both those things. I think you're sad because of them. Ben? Okay, Ben, you better give me the phone. Ben. Kelly's crying and I want to know why.